we feel very, very much at home here at Reach Church. We absolutely love you. And Gwen, we love you um, and are super grateful for your friendship. So it's a real honor and privilege for us to be here and for me to talk about this specifically. So thanks for having us. Absolutely. So uh, the first question we have is, why did you write One Way Love and what was your inspiration for writing it? What do you hope everyone comes away after reading it? Okay, those are three questions, first of all, okay. <laughs> Okay, read the first one again. Why did you write One Way Love? Money. Second question. I'm just kidding. <laughs> totally kidding. <laughs> For those of you who don't understand or know much about the publishing industry, specifically the Christian publishing industry, uh, you make no money doing this, okay? So if money is the motivating factor, you're going to be sorely disappointed. Um, I wrote it because I had to. Um, I've written seven books and I can point to a few of them and say that I wrote those books because I could. Uh, and then there are others that I say I wrote this book because I had to. Uh, it was something so deep inside of me and it had to come out. Uh, and one of the ways that stuff comes out is by preaching, teaching, speaking. Um, but the other way that comes out for me is writing. Uh, writing helps me figure out what I think oftentimes. It helps me clarify what I think about things. Um, and I was at the time and still am absolutely convinced uh, that this is this is, by the way, I wrote this book, but this is not my message, okay? Um, and I, I, I wrote it because I was so utterly convinced that this is the missing message inside the church, big time. I think for the most part, the diet of content that comes from a lot of Christian circles is a sort of do more, try harder, get better, climb higher for God uh, kind of content. Um, and uh, what's been sort of eliminated from the diet uh, is the message of it is finished. Um, that God loves us minus our own merit. Um, as we just sung a few minutes ago, the merit that we now wear is not our own. Uh, we are clothed in an irremovable suit of righteousness and forgiveness. And um, I don't know, I just, I grew up in Christian, I grew up in a Christian home, which I'm very grateful for. I uh, went to Christian schools, was sort of, um, uh, you know, thoroughly baptized in all things Christian. And uh, it took me until I was in my mid-30s to to really hear and believe that the gospel is for Christians too. I just always grew up assuming that when I heard the word gospel, that's, that's what non-Christians need to believe in order to become Christians. But once God saves us, we don't need the gospel anymore. We move on to other things like discipleship and obedience and whatever else you might want to call it. Um, and I just sort of assumed that the, the gospel was irrelevant for Christians. Um, it was relevant in the sense that we needed to go out and give it to people, but it wasn't relevant for us. Um, and I, you know, I sort of learned along the way that once God saves us, he doesn't move us beyond the gospel, but he moves us more deeply into the gospel, that the gospel is not the ABCs of the Christian faith, but the A to Z of the Christian faith. Um, and then unpacking what that gospel is. It means good news. Um, and what is the content of, and the reach of that good news. It's way more radical than I thought it was. It's way more liberating than I thought it was. Um, oftentimes when I talk about the content of this book and a few others that I've written, people will come up and say, uh, uh, I have two questions for you. Number one, is this true? And number two, if it is, um, why have I grown up in church my entire life and never heard it? Um, and those are, those are sobering questions, and they frustrate me, not because the person asking the question is frustrating me, but because the fact that somehow, somewhere along the way, they heard that the focus of the Christian faith is the life of the Christian. 
uh, is frustrating to me because thankfully it's not. Um, this whole thing isn't about you and me and what we do for God. My goodness. Um, on our best day, we don't really do much for God, okay? Uh, we may think we do. We may pride ourselves into believing that we do. Um, but as I think you quoted a few weeks ago, uh, we're all a lot worse than we think we are. And until we understand that and accept that, then grace will cease to be amazing to us. Um, it just it just won't be that important. We'll sing about it. We'll talk about it because we're Christians. We have to use that word. Um, but it doesn't sweep us off of our feet and make us weep with tears of gratitude if we don't realize how desperate we need it, um, how dire we are for it. Uh, and I just, I find that in a lot of Christian circles, um, uh, people just aren't, amazed by grace. Um, churches tend, not this one, thankfully, or else I wouldn't be here, uh, but churches tend to not be known for being really gracious places. I was just sharing with some of the leadership before this um, that in my experience, and we hear from a lot of people from all over the world, and we hear about their experiences too, um, you know, churches sadly seem to be the scariest place rather than the safest place for fallen people to fall down and broken people to break down. We have, um, we have to use a sociological term, we typically have what I call a high anthropology, okay? We think very highly of ourselves and what we're capable of. Um, I have a friend named David who wrote a book recently called Low Anthropology. <laughs> And the whole point of that book is that when we understand that we are worse than we think we are, weaker than we think we are, less capable than we think we are, that opens the door for grace in a way that not only sets us free, but bleeds onto other people um, and helps to set them free also. Um, so, I mean, I could go on and on and on about why I wrote it, but the short answer is, I had to, and the, what inspired me to write it was just the um, the deep conviction, the overwhelming conviction that this is the message that needs to not only be heard, but embodied in the life of the church. I love what you say in the, I forget, the summary of the book says, it's the only message that can set the church on fire. Yeah. And yeah. it's so true. Once you really grasp God's grace, it really fuels you in a way that couldn't otherwise. It's yeah. only by grace. So um, you referenced um, the way you grew up in Christian homes and all of those things. And um, <clears throat> one of the questions was just simply a favorite memory of your grandfather how how that was growing up. Which one? I had two grandfathers. Which one are you talking about? <laughs> My dad's dad, my mom's dad. Are you talking about the famous grandfather? It's the famous one. I had a famous grandfather and I had an infamous grandfather. <laughs> the stories of my infamous grandfather are way more interesting, um, but I won't share those. Um, gosh, a favorite memory. I've, I've been asked that question, of course, as you can imagine, a lot over the course of my life. And I, I, don't, I don't have a, a moment that stands out as my favorite. Um, I, I do have incredibly fond memories of um, him coming. He and my grandmother would come stay with us for three or four weeks. Uh, in, I grew up in South Florida and they would come stay with us around Thanksgiving for three or four weeks. And I always looked forward to that time because uh, we would see them every summer. We would spend our summers with them, and we would see them various times during the year. Um, we were all very close, very close. My mom is their oldest child, and so my mom and my grandmother were especially close. Um, so we saw them all the time. We were with them all the time. I had a guy ask me a week or so ago, so Billy Graham was your grandfather? And I said, yes. And he's like, did you ever meet him? I'm like, come on, man. <laughs> Once or twice that I can remember. Um, you know, they just assumed he was so famous and was always on the road and traveling the world. And yeah, he's your grandfather, but did you ever meet him? You know? Um, so, uh, I, I literally, I, the guy was serious too. I kind of laughed. He's, he kind of looked at me 
puzzled, like, why are you laughing at my question? And I was like, oh, you're serious, aren't you? Yeah, of course I met him, you idiot. Uh, <laughs> anyway, so, um, but I just, I, uh, we, so we spent a lot of time with them, but I think the times, ever, I so looked forward to them coming to us because we had them all to ourselves. You know, and whenever we'd go up there for the summer, my moms, you know, my aunts and uncles and cousins would also be there typically. And, um, but it was that time of the year, every year for those weeks where they just came to relax and sleep and eat and sit by the pool and go to the beach. And um, I, interestingly, one of the things that my granddad is very well known for is his humility. People who have knew him his whole life said, you know, um, here's a guy who's accomplished a world leader that has accomplished more in his lifetime than, you know, a hundred men could accomplish in their lifetime. Um, and he always remained so down to earth, so accessible, so humble. Um, and one of the best examples of that, that I remember marking me as a child growing up. And even as I, you know, got into my teenage years, whenever we would go out in public, um, go to dinner, whatever. And people would recognize him. Uh, invariably, people would recognize him. And rather than being this sort of standoffish, I'm an important guy, I'm with my family, don't talk to me kind of celebrity, um, he would stop and talk to everybody to the point where it was annoying for the, for the rest of us. We're like, Daddy Bill, that's what we called him. You know, we would go into a restaurant, we would sit at the table, and the waitress would come over four or five times, you're ready to order. We can't yet because my granddad's still over there talking to that table. And when he's done there, he's gonna go talk to that table. Um, but he's just, no one, uh, Francis Schaeffer wrote a book years ago called No Little People. Um, and there were no little people to my granddad. Um, he treated princes and paupers alike. Um, he was with the most important people of this world uh, on a variety of different occasions, and he was with nobodies, uh, what we would consider nobodies, nobody of any, um, you know, importance, so to speak. Um, and he just, I watched him treat everybody the same. He really, really cared about people. He knew God and he cared about people, and he was just, he was the real deal. He was the real deal. That's awesome. Thank you for sharing that. Um, so one of the, one of the chapters in One Way Love, I, towards the end, are objections yeah. to One Way Love. So what, over the years, have you heard probably is like one of the primary objections to the book, One Way Love, God's Radical Grace for You, the, well, what about this? Or, but what about that? What have been the primary objections? Uh, there's one primary objection. Uh, it is typically voiced in a variety of different ways, but um, regardless of which way it is voiced, the objection is the same. And it's this, if this is true, if what you're saying about the unconditionality of God's love is true, that God, there's nothing we could do to make God love us more, and there's nothing we could do to make God love us less, that God's disposition toward me or the way God feels about me has nothing to do with the way I behave. If that's true, this is the objection, then, I mean, why obey God at all? Why follow God at all? Why do what God says at all? I mean, if you keep saying this stuff, people are gonna become serial killers. I mean, we already live in sort of a, a morally bankrupt culture. Um, and I mean, my gosh, what's, what, what's to prevent things from getting worse if all you're talking about is the grace and love and forgiveness of God? It just seems so soft um, and so ineffective to really uh, instigate change, the kind of change that needs to happen. Um, I love that objection. I love it because I can demolish it. That's the reason I really love it. No, um, no, it's a legitimate question. I, I wrestled with that myself. Uh, when I first, um, I guess, encountered the truth of this, um, I had to wrestle with all of those things. Like, okay, then what is it? If, if this is true, then why do good works? Why obey God? Why 
follow God's lead and do what God says. I mean, if God's going to love me whether I do what he says or not, why do it? Okay. Um, the, the implication is that um, it's unbalanced. If this is all you, you, your responsibility is to deliver the whole counsel of God, and this is not the whole counsel of God, so you're only giving one dimension of Christianity. You're only delivering one dimension of what God wants, and that uh, sort of one-dimensionality of your message is going to prevent people from developing and growing and uh, obeying more, okay? You get the gist. Um, that's, in a variety of different ways, that's sort of the singular objection that comes. Uh, what's interesting about that objection is it exposes something. And that is that at some level, now there's a variety of ways that I'll address this, but at, it, it, the first thing I would say is that it exposes something. It exposes the fact that at some level, we have come to believe that Christianity is about behavior modification, some degree. Like what's going to prevent me from doing bad things and what's going to promote me to, or sort of uh, provoke me to do good things if this is true? Um, so that exposes the fact that what you, what you really believe is that Christianity is about my work for God, what I do for God. Uh, my obedience to God, and so on and so forth. Um, the second thing I would say is that it exposes the assumption that grace, the radicality of God's grace, the one-way loveness of God's grace, is an enemy to transformation rather than a catalyst for transformation. Um, so the first thing I would say is that uh, Christianity is not a message of our transformation. It's not. It is fundamentally a message about Christ's substitution, first and foremost. Um, substitution is the root. Transformation is the fruit. And it's very important to keep those two things in that particular order. Um, so without the rootedness of substitution, transformation doesn't happen. Transformation can't happen. Um, uh, but it's not, this whole thing is not about us becoming better people and sinning less and being transformed in those. That's not what this is about, okay? That's what I've discovered over the years a lot of people think Christianity is about. And it now becomes all about me and what I need to do for God rather than God and what he's done for me. Um, it's kind of like I needed Jesus a lot at the beginning of my Christian life because I was bad. But now that I'm getting better and better and better, I don't need Jesus as much now. So we don't have to talk about him as much now as we did at the beginning. Um, so I would say it, it, it exposes this assumption that Christianity is about behavior modification. It exposes the assumption that grace uh, is an enemy uh, to transformation and change, not a catalyst for it. Um, Here's the other thing I would say to the objection that if this is what you do, if this is what you deliver to people, they're going to get worse, not better, uh, is I have never in my life met one person whose heart has been so gripped and so grasped by the love and forgiveness and grace of God that it makes them want to be worse. Never. <laughs> I mean, let me give you an example, okay? And I, this is an example that I've given in a variety of different places. If I come home from a bad day of work and my wife Stacy's at home um, and I'm just being short and snippy with her, I'm being a jerk, okay? Which, I, that, this never happens, by the way. This is just an example, an, un, an example that has never actually happened in our home. But let's just say I'm being a jerk, okay? I'm being short, I'm being snippy. It's clear to her that I uh, there's something wrong and I'm taking it out on her. Um, now, she can react in one of two ways. She can retaliate. Like, listen, you jerk. What's the matter with you? I didn't say anything or do anything to you. I had a rough day too and you're taking it out on me. What's the matter with you, okay? Or she could sort of, tenderly come up to me, um, put her hands on either side of my face and look at me and say, honey, I, apparently you've had a rough day, but I just want you to know I love you no matter what. Now, is that response from her going to make me want to continue being a jerk? Or is that response from her going to make me go, honey, I'm sorry, man. 
It's, it's not you. I'm totally, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. It's going to make me feel bad about the fact that I was being a jerk. And it's going to make me want to stop being a jerk. That's the effect that grace and love has on people. When we are given love and grace, especially in those moments when we know we least deserve it, it actually softens us and it makes us want to sin less, not more. Um, it's when Paul, when the Apostle Paul, and this is always the passage that comes up, yeah, but the Apostle Paul in Romans 6 says, should we go on sinning so that grace may abound? And by no means, he says. Um, and uh, one thing I point out, I said, don't stop there, keep reading, okay? Keep reading. Because what Paul does in Romans chapter 4, in Romans chapter 5, he has very deeply explained uh, the power and the radical nature of the gospel, okay? That uh, Jesus paid it all, that we live our lives under a banner that reads, it is finished, that we are clothed in the righteousness of Christ, okay? He talks about that very eloquently and very deeply in Romans 4 and 5. And then he anticipates this question at the beginning of Romans 6 where he says, now I know what you're thinking. In light of everything I just told you, you're thinking, well, if it's true what you just said, Paul, in Romans 5, that where there is a lot of sin, there is even more grace, then shouldn't we just keep sinning so that we get more grace? And Paul says, by no means, no. And then he goes on. And what he does is very interesting there. Rather than pulling back from the message of grace, he pushes it deeper in because his whole point there is, if that's what you think, it's not because you've gotten grace too much. It's because you've gotten grace too little. So I got to push it in deeper. Um, so um, A, this whole thing is not about you and me and how we behave and how we live. That's not it. I know for some of us, that's a struggle because that's what we've heard our whole lives. Our whole lives, we've heard that. And so to hear this, it sounds like, who is this radical dude standing up here telling us something we've never heard before? Let me just tell you, like I said before, this is not my message, okay? This, this message isn't new. It only seems new because it's so old and it's been lost for so long in this morass of morality that we have, that we think is Christianity, that it seems new. It seems novel. This is old, okay? This is old stuff, real old. Um, this is like Jesus stuff, the Apostle Paul stuff, Martin Luther stuff, okay? This is nothing new and novel up here. Uh, it just seems so radical because for so long we've believed that Christianity is all about me and what I do for God and how I live for God and whether or not I'm being faithful to God and whether or not I'm being obedient to God. It's all about me. It's very narcissistic, okay? It's very much all about me and what I do. And because we've heard that for so long in a variety of different ways, when someone stands up and says, this isn't about you at all, at all. God's love for you has nothing to do with you. Nothing. It has everything to do with what Jesus has done for you. Full stop, period. That's it. Um, God's dis The way God feels about you, his disposition towards you has nothing to do with you. Nothing at all. It has to do entirely with what has been done for you. Okay. So when, when that is the truth, and it doesn't seem right because we've heard something different for so long, for so long. Um, and so with this idea that, you know, if this is the message of Christianity, then what's to prevent people from doing bad things? Um, well, it's not about doing bad things or not doing bad things, okay? Uh, first of all. Second of all, when your heart, when you're at your worst, Okay, and I love when in 1 Corinthians where Paul is introducing communion um, and he says, this is the way I want you guys to do it. On the night he was betrayed, Jesus took bread and broke it and said, this is my body broken for you. Paul, the apostle Paul could have described that night in a thousand different ways. He could have said on the night that uh, Jesus had his last meal with his disciples, on the night that Jesus was arrested, on the night before Jesus was, was, was tried and crucified. Um, he could have, he, a thousand different ways. And he chose to describe that night by saying, on the night he was betrayed, he took bread and broke it and said, this is my body broken for you. 
Uh, and his whole point in saying that is God's mode of operation, okay, his mode of operation is to give us his best when we are at our worst. And it's that truth alone which softens hard heart, softens hard hearts and opens blind eyes and, and makes us want to love our neighbor. Rather than, you know, kind of, I'm better than them. It just, it is, it is a self-righteous, grace is a self-righteousness killer, man. Killer. Um, because it announces that uh, we get all of the goods from God and have deserved the exact opposite. Undeserved favor. That's what grace means. So um, there, there's no need to, to even put the word balance and grace in the same sentence is dangerous. Grace is so radically unbalanced, thankfully. I mean, the last thing you and I need are is sort of the balances to be equal. My gosh, I mean, it is radically unbalanced, radically, radically unbalanced. And we can all be incredibly grateful for that because there would be no way in without that. Dang, dude, let's go. <laughs> Class dismissed. <laughs> Get out of here. <laughs> I don't even know what you guys. What else do we need to know? <laughs> wow, you just answered all the questions. <laughs> um, anyway, um, I did uh, some of the questions asked about where repentance fits into this whole thing. So, you know, if we're saying God's, God's love toward us can't be altered, affected by what we do, well, you know, what, what is this idea of repentance? Obviously, it's scriptural. It's all through scripture. If we confess our sins, God is faithful, righteous to, to forgive us our sins, cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So, the, you know, those types of verses in scripture about repentance, how does that all fit in with this? Yeah, that's good. Well, um, I think, uh, in a sense, grace uh, not only promotes repentance, but produces it. Uh, in the example that I just gave about me coming home and being a jerk, well, you could, if using biblical language or theological language, you can say what I really needed to do was repent. Well, what was it that caused my repentance to Stacy in that moment? It was the deliverance of grace to me when I didn't deserve it, love to me when I didn't deserve it. It was the deliverance of one-way love, which made me go, I'm sorry, gosh, I'm sorry, I didn't, please forgive me. Um, so I, I think it's really important to define what repentance is, first of all. Um, and I love the way uh, I've heard it defined before, and I can't remember where I heard this. It was a quote in a very old book. Um, and essentially, I'm not going to get this right, but essentially the way the author defined repentance was simply agreeing with God about your need for grace. I love that. Um, you know, it's like, what is repentance? A, a, repentance is getting to a place where I agree with God that I need grace. Uh, for whatever it may be. Um, so, uh, yes, I, I, I think re repent, let's also say, okay, point out, repentance is not a work on your part. Repentance itself is a gift from God, okay? So if you find yourself in a posture of repentance, don't pat yourself on the back. Thank God, okay? Because that is a gift to you. Uh, the gift of making you aware of how you've fallen short, how you've hurt this person, how you've whatever, screwed things up. And that awareness, that awakeness to that um, is a gift from God. Without God gifting you that awareness, there would be no repentance, okay? So it is a gift from God. Um, and then it's simply recognizing, agreeing with God just how much grace you need. That is why Martin Luther, you know, in his 95 theses that he wrote uh, challenging the church of his day and some of the church's practices of his day. Um, this was way back in 1517. Martin Luther, who was a, a Roman Catholic uh, priest and a teacher of theology, 
was teaching his way through Romans and was so scandalized by what the Bible said and how different what the Bible said was from what the church of his day was saying that he wrote 95, uh, I don't know, 95 statements uh, sort of, in a sense, challenging the church to consider what the Bible says. He didn't mean for it to start something big. He just wanted there to be sort of a town-wide discussion about it. Um, and of course, it launched an entire movement. Uh, he wasn't planning on doing that, but it launched an entire movement. Um, and the very first statement, the very first statement he made, the, the, he wrote 95 of them. Statement number one was, all of life is repentance. All of life is repentance. Um, and that's the point. The point is that we never arrive. Um, we never get to a point where we don't need grace. Uh, we never get to a point where we're like, okay, God, thanks for your help. I'll take it from here. Uh, we never, we never get to a place where, um, where we're okay without God and his grace. And so repentance is an ongoing increasing awareness of that over the course of our of our lives. Um, one of the things that was, I think, a key takeaway for me in reading the book, and I know from several people who went through the study of the book, was discovering all of the subtle ways. I'm going off script now, but whatever. No, I don't, I, 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 I don't, yeah, that's totally fine. But uh, all, the, all the subtle ways where the law creeps back into our lives. Like we, you talk about that a lot. We don't always see it. Um, we don't always diagnose it, but it's there. The, the ways that the law creeps back in, um, both in our lives or interactions with other people and in the church in general. Um, what are some of the, what are, can you talk about that? What are some of the primary ways that you see the law um, creeping back in into our lives and in the message uh, in the church in general today? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, I can answer both of those. There's really two questions. How is it? How do we see it creeping into our lives? Um, and how does it continually creep into the messaging of the church? Um, when I'm feeling competitive, when I find myself keeping score, when I find myself in a state of evaluation, evaluating other people, evaluating my wife, my kids, whatever, um, measuring myself up against other people to see how and where I stand, um, feeling the need to constructively criticize somebody or deliver the truth in love to somebody. Um, <laughs> You know, when, when, I, when I find myself sort of salivating at that kind of stuff, that's when I know I'm sort of uh, bending toward the law. Um, <clears throat> now, let me say this, um, and I make this as clear as I can in the book, um, <clears throat> that uh, the law is not bad. The law is good. Um, God speaks two words to us. And all of the words in the Bible can fall under one of these two categories, law or gospel. The, the, both of those words come from God, which means both are by, by necessity good, okay? Uh, the law is anything in the Bible that either explicitly states or insinuates do. And the gospel is anything in the Bible that either explicitly states or insinuates done, okay? Okay. So you can look at the verses, all the verses in the Bible and, you know, sort of categorize them into one of those two categories. Um, both are good, but both have very unique job descriptions. It is the job description of the law to diagnose us. It is the job description of the gospel to deliver us. So I think it was John Calvin who said, the law demands everything and gives us nothing. And the gospel demands nothing and gives us everything, okay? So those two words are absolutely necessary for us to hear our entire lives, even as a Christian. The law is key in reminding me of how much I need the gospel um, constantly. So, um, so in that sense, I'm not, when, I'm, when I talk about the law and sometimes I speak about it negatively, I don't mean that it's bad. 
I mean that it has a negative influence in our lives, a necessary negative influence in our lives in the sense that it necessarily exposes me, diagnoses me, shows me just how far from God's demands and requirements I fall. Um, and then the gospel comes in and reminds me that Jesus met all of those demands for me, like we just sang about a few minutes ago. Um, Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, I have not come to abolish the law, because that was the rap on Jesus, you know, that he was soft on sin. He was hanging out with all of these people that were, you know, sort of spiritual riffraff type people, and the religious leaders couldn't stand him. They, they were convinced that he was an imposter, because no man of God in his right mind would hang out with people like that. And so the charge against him from the religious community was this guy's soft on sin. He, he, he's, he's come to sweep God's standards under the rug and excuse people. Um, and Jesus corrected that in the Sermon on the Mount. He said, I have not come to abolish the law. I've come to fulfill it because you can't do it. The law has to be fulfilled, has to be fulfilled. God's standard has to be met. That's the bad news. Um, the bad, well, the bad news is that we can't meet God's standard, no matter how hard we try. Um, so your getting better doesn't get you in with God. Your self-improvement doesn't get you in with God. Your spiritual progress doesn't get you in with God. None of that stuff in, within God's economy, it is perfection or failure. That's it. That's it. Two options. Um, and so, uh, because we are incapable of meeting God's requirements, Jesus had to meet those requirements for us. So picture, uh, or a picture that I, or um, an illustration that I use to describe sort of the double-sidedness of the good news of the gospel is this. Um, let's just say uh, uh, Tyler here, uh, is because of terrible spending habits for 25 years of his life has accumulated $30 million in debt. Okay. Um, and, uh, and it, it, right. <laughs> and his wife leaves him because of it. Okay. Now, um, so, but he's, you know, he's, he's, um, uh, he's accumulated this debt and it's hanging over him like just a dark thundercloud every moment of every day. Uh, his marriage is tense because of it. He feels a tremendous amount of guilt and shame because of it. He's put his family in jeopardy because of it. Most likely, uh, because his debt is so big, his kids are going to inherit it when he dies. And now they're going to be in debt because of him and all of those things. Okay. Um, and, uh, he, I mean, this is, you know, I've talked to people who are in debt deep and it ruins lives. I mean, it makes life hard and heavy and you're just dying for some relief. You feel like you're in a dark hole and there's no way you can get out of it. I mean, I've talked to people in this situation. Uh, it's daunting. There's, it seems so hopeless. Um, and so let's say, you know, Tyler gets up one morning and has an appointment at the bank to try to negotiate a lower interest rate because he heard interest rates were dropping. So he wanted to go negotiate a lower interest rate. Uh, and as soon as he walks in the bank, the bank president meets him in the lobby and says, Tyler, you're not going to believe this. But some, some guy walked in here earlier today and paid your debt in full. In full. It, it, he paid it in full. And Tyler's going, dude, what is it? My candid camera? Is this a joke? Like, what, what do you say that? Say what? Okay. It's like, dude, I know I'm just as shocked as you are, but this guy came in today and asked for your name and asked how much debt you had and paid it in full, Tyler, you're no longer in debt. You are a debt-free man. I mean, he would be, it would like be, like he won the lottery. Like he got his life back. He can't wait to get home and, and tell his family that we're no longer under this cloud of debt. We're free. I don't know who paid it, but somebody paid it. And just about the moment he's getting ready to do backflips outside the door of the bank to get home and tell Gwen and the kids, uh, the bank president says, oh, stop, that's not it. It's even better than that. Not only did this person uh, pay down all of your debt so that you're debt-free, he also deposited $50 million into your account. $50 million. So that even if your spending habits don't change, you can never, ever go into debt again. Ever. Okay? Now, that's the gospel. 
The gospel isn't just your debt has been forgiven. Thank, as great as that is, thankfully, but it's not just that you're, it's not just that a debt has been paid. It's that a deposit has been made, a made for you in the form of Christ's perfect righteousness. Perfect righteousness has been deposited into your account. So you are not only debt free, you are incapable of going into debt again. You are incapable of going into debt again. That's the gospel. Okay. I think a lot of people are kind of okay with the, my debt's been paid, but then this is what happens in a lot of Christian circles. Your debt's been paid, but now be careful how you live and spend your money because you could easily get back into this same mess again and get back into the same sort of debt again. So now the Christian life becomes all about the, thank you God for paying my debt, but my gosh, I better walk a straight and narrow line or else I'm going to go into debt again and be right in the same mess that I was. Okay. That, that, that's why it doesn't sound like good news. What sounds like good news is not simply that our law breaking has been forgiven, but that all of Christ's law keeping has been deposited into our account. Okay, that's when Jesus says, I have not come to abolish it, but to fulfill it because I'm getting ready to make a deposit that's gonna blow your mind. Blow your mind so that you can never ever go into debt again. That's that's why the gospel's such good news. Um, and I, you know, as... As much as people want to go, yeah, but I mean, how, but I mean, what's that? How is that going to prevent us from doing bad things? If we can never go into debt again, then why not just eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow we die, you know? Um, and it goes back to what I said earlier. When that truth that I just delivered grips your heart, the first question you ask is, oh, good. Now what can I go spend it on? <laughs> it's, man, thank you, God. Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. Take my moments and my days. Let them flow in ceaseless praise. That is the response of a heart that is gripped and grasped by grace. Not, oh, good, now I can go do whatever I want. I can go hurt other people um, and do whatever I want. Um, so I, I think that uh, we see the law creep back into our lives when we stop believing that. When we stop believing that, then we resort to our own methods. And since the Garden of Eden, our own methods have been law. So, uh, wow, thank you for that. That was amazing. Isn't that great? Come on. Um, let's, do, uh, let's do one more question. And then uh, if anyone has any questions, this, this was Tullian's idea, by the way. So I wanted the whole thing to be you guys just <laughs> asking questions. I love that. I like live Q&A. So, so don't be shy. That's no, the point. You do not be shy. Please, if you have a question, think of it. We'll just uh, ask one more while you're thinking of your questions. And I think we have someone with a mic who will uh, give you the mic so we can hear you. Um, let's see. Oh, here's a good question. How do you teach the commands of the Bible without it coming across as legalism? In other words, how do you give an application in a sermon or a Bible study? Those are two different questions. Um, multiple layered questions. Yeah, yeah, it is. Um, so uh, I don't like application in that regard. Because it's just, there are two kinds of sermons. There's law gospel sermons, and there's law gospel law sermons, okay? Um, anything that a preacher says after it is finished uh, is a going back to what we must do, okay? So this is the, the, the form of a proper sermon um, should be law then gospel. So all of my sermons have two points. I don't say this, point one, point two, and I don't oftentimes use the word law and gospel. But what I'm doing in my preaching is the first part of my sermon is diagnostic. I want to preach in such a way that everybody in the room recognizes their need for God and his grace. And maybe they're feeling good and proud of the fact that they're in church and they're not like those people who aren't, blah, blah, blah. And I've got to preach in such a way that levels the playing field and helps them see I'm no better than the worst person I know. That's point one. Point two is then to come in and say, but Jesus did meet all of God's requirements for you. And because of that, you are now free. You live your life under a banner that reads, it is finished. That's the sermon. Anything that I would say after that, like, okay, now what does this mean and how should this, uh, just stop with all that stuff, okay? The, uh, so I would say, on the one hand, I don't like, I do, 
now when speaking about application, I will say this. Uh, I'm all for application in a sermon, but not the kind of application that we typically think. I am for, I, I'm about application that has not nothing to do with me and what I must do as much as Jesus and what he's done. Christ's finished work applied to me. That's what I need. That's what I crave. That's what I need to hear. Um, so that's the second question. The first question is, um, the first question was, it was, uh, how do you teach commands yeah. without it coming across as legalism? You teach them full throttle. So for instance, Jesus, again, in the Sermon on the Mount, he says, uh, so you've heard it said, um, that if you, uh, if you don't murder anybody, you're, you're fine. But I tell you, if you harbor a grudge against somebody, you're just as guilty in the courtroom of God as the person who carries it out. Jesus is always getting to the heart of the matter. You think you're doing okay because you haven't committed adultery, but I tell you, if you've ever lusted for a second in your heart before God, you're just as guilty as the person who carries it out. So Jesus doesn't lower the bar of the law. He raises it to such a degree that no sane person is going to be able to look at that raised bar and say, I got that. Which is why he concludes that whole section in the Sermon on the Mount by simply saying, now I, let me just conclude everything I've just said with this sentence. You must be perfect, therefore, as your Father in heaven is perfect. I mean, that's just a, that is the proper use of the law. If you're going to, I mean, preach it full throttle. Don't give some cheap version like, do your best and God will do the rest. Be a good husband. Try to be a nice guy. I mean, that's not, the, the law is be perfect as your father in heaven is perfect. So when I'm preaching the law, the reason it doesn't lead to legalism is because um, I am, I'm preaching it in a way that exposes the fact that on our best day, we haven't kept it for a second, for a second. And even when we might think we're keeping it on the outside, we're not keeping it on the inside. Um, so it's not just don't murder, it's don't harbor a grudge. In fact, it's not just don't harbor a grudge, it's you must not even want to harbor a grudge. The desire to harbor a grudge, even if you don't harbor a grudge, and even if you don't kill somebody, that still doesn't cut it. Like you have to be perfect in your, in your motivation, in your expression, in your thoughts, in your feelings. Everything has to be sinless in order for it to be acceptable to God. So preach the law full throat, man. I mean, give it to them straight. God doesn't serve mixed drinks. He serves two separate shots, law, then gospel. And a lot of sermons are a cocktail of law and gospel mixed, you know? I mean, it's shot, shot. Um, that's what he, that's what he serves. Um, and so, yeah, I would, I, I don't think if the law, the, the only way the law becomes legalism is if we preach it cheaply. If we preach a cheap law, it becomes legalistic because now we're, what we're doing is we're saying, we've lowered the bar to such a degree that we've convinced everybody around us that you can do it. You just gotta jump higher. You just gotta be more disciplined. You gotta pray a little more. You, you, you gotta be a little bit more faithful. You gotta give a little bit more. You gotta, you just, you gotta be more obedient. That's all you gotta do. So come, I mean, we lower the bar and then there are some people who jump over it and feel very proud about it and go, well, that makes me a pretty good Christian. And it frustrates me that my husband hasn't jumped over it yet. I'm not even sure he can jump over it. <laughs> Okay, or my friend, or so-and-so, or whatever. Um, so you end up in a place of either delusion or despair when the law is cheapened. Either delusion, like, I can do it, or despair that just says, no, I can't. So raise the bar. Cheap grace is not the problem. Cheap law is the problem. We've made the law doable, when in reality, uh, it's, it's un we can't do it. We can't which is why Jesus had to do it for us. And like I said before, all of his, you know, the, the debt we owed because we weren't keeping the law has been paid. Um, and the law that Jesus kept for us, every jot and every tittle that Jesus kept for us, 
uh, is now deposited into our account. So, Well, now it's your turn. <laughs> if you have a question that you'd at, like telling to answer right now on the spot, on the spot, on the spot, raise your hand. We'll bring you a mic and uh, ask away. Awesome. Hey. <laughs> it's Wilson. <laughs> and it kind of flows from what we were just talking. Um, with the law of gospel distinction, one of the things you said is the two words that God speaks to us in Scripture are either law or gospel. And I guess my question is, where would you place the words in literature? So like Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, uh, and all those, like what, on, on what side would you place those? And how do you work through the words in literature in your opinion? Yeah, so, I mean, it's, it's both. I mean, depending on which psalm I'm reading or which part of which psalm I'm reading, there are some psalms that um, are uh, intended to expose and then there are some psalms that are intended to exonerate. And even in the course of a particular psalm, um, you know, there's, uh, I can think specifically of, of Psalm 46, um, where, you know, it sort of starts off with um, this embrace of God being our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. I mean, that's that's gospel. Um and then it also goes on to describe you know, times, moments, seasons of, of desperation um, and how I can't do life. I can't do what you're expecting me to do type stuff. I mean, that would be, that would be law. So it really does, I mean, whether it's the prophetic literature or wisdom literature or apocalyptic literature or Paul's epistles or the gospels or, um, you know, the first five books of the Bible, um, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, or the historical books of the Bible, First and Second Samuel, and and whatnot, First Second Chronicles, First Second Kings. Um, it, it depends on which passage we're looking at. Essentially, I mean, I think the the important thing is to recognize again that both are good, both are necessary for us to hear, um, and wherever we find it, in whatever genre we find it in the Bible. Uh, those those two words and the fulfillment of their job descriptions remain the same: expose, exonerate, diagnose, deliver. And 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 let me say this too: Martin Luther made the point that the only person who can uh, infallibly uh, distinguish law and gospel is the Holy Spirit. And the reason he said that, and I'll give you this example, is. You know, we've been, I've just sort of explained, God's given us two tools in our toolbox, uh, law and gospel. And um, Martin Luther said that the law is for the hard-hearted and the gospel is for the brokenhearted, okay? So the law is intended to sort of, uh, to, um, to expose a hard heart and hopefully break it. And then once that heart is broken, then we deliver the gospel to that broken heart. Um, the difficulty is discerning the, the difference between a hard heart and a broken heart. So I've had people come to me over the years and they appear to have a broken heart. And so I'm, you know, sort of tending to you take the gospel out of the toolbox. But then when you dig just under the surface, they're really masking a very hard heart. Um, and then other people have come and they appear, at you know, sort of in the first little engagement that they're hard hearted. But then when you press a little bit further, what you find is underneath that veneer of hard-heartedness is a bona fide broken-heartedness. So giving a broken-hearted person uh, the law is horrible. It's like, it's like shouting to a drowning person, kick faster and paddle harder. Um, you know, it's like telling them, it's literally like telling a one-legged person to jump higher and higher and higher. Uh, it's cruel to give a broken-hearted person the law. Uh, it can also be dangerous to give a to give a uh, a hard-hearted person the gospel. Um, what they need is the law in that moment to sort of, you know, churn things up and show them. And I've had a lot of experience in my just in my pastoral counseling 
um, experiences where, you know, I mean, the, the, the law, the hard heartedness that someone harbors toward their wife or toward their husband or, you know, toward a friend or a colleague or their parent or whatever, um, can be very, um, disabling to their lives and to the lives of other people. What they need to know is they're no better than the person they're harboring a grudge against. Um, and, and the law is what does that. So yeah, I would say, I mean, that's a, that, that, that's a Wilson, that's a great question. And, you know, one that would probably upon more investigation require a, a more academic answer, but for our purposes, that would be the, what I would say. Yeah, you're welcome. We got one back here. Mr. Bob. <laughs> what, how, how do you overcome guilt with one way alone? Mm. I, mean, guilt, I mean, guilt is that kind of thing kind of sleeps in the background, but every time you do something, it rings inside your head. You did it, you're totally of it. Mm. That's a great question. Um, let me start off by saying that the only relief we will ever get, even if it's momentary, will be those moments where we actually believe God loves us no matter what. Having said that, we will never experience full and final relief from that until we die or Jesus comes back. We just, we won't. I mean, I, there are things I shouldn't feel guilty about anymore because I know I've been forgiven by God, but I still do. And when I feel those sometimes paralyzing feelings of guilt, it just, it pushes me back to the truth of one way love. It's like a thorn in our flesh. You know, Paul asked so many times, he said, I asked God three times to remove this thorn in the flesh and he wouldn't do it. Um, and then God gave his reason why he didn't do it because this keeps you dependent on me. This reminds you of how much you need me. Um, so I could put it this way. If, if I didn't wrestle with guilt and shame and regret for things I've done or failed to do, one way love would be irrelevant to me. It's because I wrestle with those things that I become increasingly aware of how much I need the truth of one way love. Um, so having said that, in like I said at the, at the top, when um, you know, when I'm when I do experience momentary relief from guilt. And that momentary relief will one day be permanent, uninterrupted relief, thank God. But until that day, my relief is momentary. But that momentary sense of relief always, 10 times out of 10, coincides with a revisiting of the fact that God loves me no matter what that others may hold my sins against me, I may hold my sins against me, but God doesn't hold my sins against me because God held my sins against Christ, period. And I have to revisit that. I wish I could go, here's, believe this, this, and this, and you'll never deal with guilt again. Because even if you're able to deal with past guilt, future guilt's coming. <laughs> I mean, it's coming. You're, you're going to say something, do something, fail to do something, fail to say something uh, until the day you die that is has the potential of accumulating even more guilt. Um, but to know that God loves me no matter what and does not, I'm not guilty in Christ. I'm righteous. And God doesn't hold my sins against me. Um, his love toward us is one way in that regard. That is... Those are the moments when I feel free from the guilt that I feel, even if it's just for a moment. Great question. You're welcome. Thanks so much for sharing, Tillian. Um, 
earlier when you were answering a question, you mentioned that when you start thinking about like speaking the truth in love, kind of sense yourself leaning towards the law. Um, and I think that's a phrase that probably a lot of people in Christian circles are familiar with. And um, I know like in our college ministry, in the context of discipleship, that came up a lot. So I'm just wondering your thoughts on where does that fit and does it fit in this idea of one-way love in the gospel in terms of doing life on life with people in small groups or accountability or in a marriage, like the idea of sanctification or the reproof of a brother. What does that look like? Is there is there a place yeah. for that? Sure. Yeah, of course. I think it's <clears throat> I think the 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 question is the ultimate question when it comes to all of that stuff is how does change actually happen in a person? What is it? What is the instrument that actually changes a person? Um and so when what we assume, what a lot of us assume, what I still assume wrongly sometimes, is that telling someone what to do is what will inspire them to do it. We, I mean, I have three kids and three grandkids, and this is a mistake we make very close to home. If I just tell them what to do, that will be what inspires them to do it or causes them to do it. Um, and so I, I think a lot of, a lot of, in a lot of Christian circles, we think that too. This is a brother with a blind spot. I need to go to him, tell him. And by me telling him that he has this blind spot, confronting him about this, that the confrontation itself will be what changes the person. Um, and that just, it has not happened in the history of humanity. <laughs> Telling someone what to do has never inspired the person to do it. Um, now, it may cause them to do it on the outside. Uh, you tell a kid what to do. If you're a mom or dad, you tell a kid what to do, and they do it. And you think to yourself, well, that's what inspired them to do it. Well, that's what they did because they didn't want to get in trouble for not doing it. Um, but it doesn't in any way show a real heart change. I think when we, if we look at law and gospel, I think we have to ask, what is it that, ex which one of those is the primary change agent? So if someone is really going to change, I may need to hear, I may need to be confronted by my wife about a blind spot that I have, but that's not going to be what ultimately changes me. That's sort of the first step in change. What actually brings about the change um, is her love and grace and mercy and forgiveness. That's what actually brings about change. So, um, you know, I think a lot of those things, it's not, accountability is not the issue. Discipleship's not the issue. Uh, none of those things in and of themselves are the issue. It's the fact that we oftentimes assume that confrontation what we call speaking the truth in love, which I would simply define as um, speak one-way love to people lovingly. <laughs> That's speaking the truth in love. So, um, so all of those things in and of themselves are not bad. It's just the fact that what, in my experience, what has been so closely associated with all that stuff is this idea, or at least this assumption, that every accountability group I've ever been a part of, college and beyond, and before and beyond, uh, there, was, there was this sort of assumption. It wasn't necessarily overt or explicit or even articulated this way, but there was this assumption that um, if, we, if, if you are told what you need to do, you will then be empowered to do it. Um, if you're told how you need to change, being told how you need to change is what will change you. So the thing that's missing in your life is the fact that you need to be told to change. Um, and if I tell you to do it and I show you where you need to do it, that my job is done. And now I can just, you know, you're, it's gonna happen. And that's just, the law doesn't have, I mean, the, like Paul says, 
in Romans 7, the law has had an incredible impact on me. It has shown me how desperately I need the gospel. Um, so I would, I think in those sort of, especially in interpersonal relationships, that sort of law gospel distinction is really practical and really helpful because I can say, does this, is this a moment where this person needs the law or the gospel? But then not making the assumption that giving the law is what will change them. Giving the law won't change them. The law shows us our need for change, but the law itself doesn't change us. Only the gospel does. The, the, you put it this way. The law shows us what a sanctified life looks like, but the law itself can't sanctify. That's the job description of the gospel. The, you could say the law shows us what godliness looks like. Love your neighbor as you love yourself and love the Lord your God, our heart, mind, soul, and strength. I mean, the law sh shows us what godliness looks like, but the law doesn't have the power to make you godly. Only the gospel can do that. So I hope that helps. What else? Oh, we got one over here where a microphone is making its way to you. I was wondering, how do you um, deal with people that expect you to meet their standards, but you can't even meet God's standards? How do you, because it's a burden in life, how do you navigate that burden, knowing that according to we are all under grace, but there's always a standard put on us by everyone around us, which then can sometimes pull us away from God because we are so burdened by other people wanting us to meet their standards. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I don't think we will ever, I don't think we will ever uh, escape that. Whether it's someone in our lives, it could be a spouse, it could be a parent, it could be a child, it could be a friend, or if it's just society in general. You know, you have to look a certain way and become a certain way. If you want to get love and you want to be accepted and you want to be respected, you have to accomplish certain things and do certain things and meet certain standards. And so, I mean, a society in general is all law and no gospel. And sometimes our relationships feel that way too. All law and no gospel. And I don't think in this life anyway, there's any full and final escape from that. I think there is hope in this, in this regard um, that the way our failure to meet others' expectations makes us feel doesn't have to feel as debilitating as it often does in light of one-way love. So for instance, um, um, because God loves me unconditionally, I'm okay with other people not liking me. Now, that doesn't mean I want other people not to like me. Um, I'm not doing anything intentionally to try and make people not like me. Um, but, um, but if the only person's approval I need is God's, ultimately, and I already have it, then that sets me free from needing your approval. I mean, I may like to have it. It may do something for me if I get it, but I don't need it to survive. Um, I have a, um, I have something I would like to read. The problem is the glasses I brought that require, that I require broke on the airplane. Um, they were only $400 and you said you would pay for them. So thanks, Tyler. I appreciate it. You know, the glasses I wear are about 15 cents. What are those, honey? I know they're glasses, but are they like the cheetah ones? Wow, that you look, they're pink. <laughs> White, wow. All right, hold on. Let me see. <laughs> Now's the time to take pictures and post Put them on social media. Put your cameras away. Put them away. Um, I am, I, I want to, I I'm very much want to read you guys something. Stop laughing, please. 
Okay, I hear laughing. Yeah, what an idiot. That guy looks like such a moron. Just stop, please. So I'm very, this is very embarrassing. I don't need you guys to like me because I know God loves me, so stop. I'm just kidding. Um, okay, let me... Um, I want to read some. I want to read something to you, to all of you, but I think it answers that particular question specifically. Um, I, about a year and a half ago, we had a worship night at our church that we call Tetelestai, which is Greek for "It is finished." And um, at the end of our at the, at the end of our worship night, I stood up to read something I had written earlier that day. Like, what do those three words "It is finished"? How do they really impact my life here and now? So I want to read you some of these. Because it is finished, you are free from the impossible burden of having to earn God's love and acceptance. Because it is finished, there is nothing you can ever do or fail to do that will tempt God to leave you, forsake you, or stop loving you. Because it is finished, you cannot sin beyond the coverage of God's forgiveness. Because it is finished, the sins you can't forget, God doesn't remember. Because it is finished, you are not defined by your worst moments or your greatest accomplishments, your struggles or your successes, your strengths or your weaknesses. You are defined by who you belong to. Because it is finished, you can talk truthfully about the worst parts of you without being afraid of others' disapproval. Because the only approval that ultimately matters is God's and you already have it. Because it is finished, you can endure rejection from others because you will never have to endure rejection from God, ever. Because it is finished, you can freely admit when you are wrong because your value is not dependent on being right, but rather on the rightness of Jesus that covers you. Because it is finished, God loves you unconditionally, and that means you are free from needing everybody else to like you. Because it is finished, you can love others without needing them to love you back, because all of the love you need, you already have. Because it is finished, who you ultimately are has nothing to do with you. Your identity is firmly anchored in Jesus' performance, not yours. His record, not yours. You are not what you do or don't do. You are what Jesus has done for you. Because it is finished, we can join our voices with the song of heaven in Revelation 5 and say, we are not worthy, but the lamb who was slain is worthy. And by the grace of his saving death, we are what we are, beloved sons and daughters of God. So I, you can have them now if you want. Um, I am... Um, I like it when I'm liked, when other people approve of me. Um, but there's a difference between liking that and needing that to survive. And the only thing I need in order to survive is God's love and approval, and I already have it. So that helps me navigate uh, my failure to meet other people's expectations or other people's disappointment in me or other people demanding that I become a certain way or do certain things and I can never be good enough for them and I can never be lovely enough for them. I'm, I can never be accepted by them and all of that stuff. Um, that can paralyze you if you need them to like you. But if you don't need them to like you, it's, it has less of an effect. So it's not so much that we can get to a point where we can avoid that stuff. We won't. But we can get to the point where that stuff doesn't affect us as much as it used to because of this message. So I hope that helps. Well, I think we have time for one more, que one more question. Wow, you got lucky, Diana. Yeah. She got so lucky. One of my, one of my favorites. Diana. Oh, yeah? Yeah. I thought pastors weren't question. supposed to have favorites. They do, right? Oh, I absolutely do. <laughs> and there are people I can't stand. I'm just kidding. I don't have any of those. <laughs> That's not true. You told me about four or five people in this room that you hate. <laughs> just kidding. Say that again. Oh, we have two. Okay, two. Okay. That's fine. All right. Two more Diana, questions. Diana, you're first. 
Um, so we've talked a lot about the content of the message and the fact that you've wanted people to hear it and diving deeper into what it is. I guess my question is moving forward, what do you hope the people in this room, what changes after they leave this room, after hearing this message, what do you hope the, like how do you hope for it to affect us? Rest. Just exhale. Um, I mean, just experience the freedom of knowing that you're loved no matter what. That's There's just so much rest that comes from that. You know, um, when, when Jesus tells, uh, invites weary and burdened people to come to him to find rest. And I, honestly, there are just, I don't know, churches are afraid of giving you the freedom to rest. You know, because then you won't volunteer in the nursery and you won't give your money and you won't, you know, blah, blah, blah. Um, but I mean, just my hope and prayer is that you, regardless of what you are experiencing now, what you have experienced in this broken world as a broken person, or what you will experience in this broken world as a broken person, that you would know that God's feelings toward you, his disposition toward you, uh, never changes. And that gives us uh, sort of a, um, a quiet knowing in the deepest parts of our being, even when life sucks. And it will. It's inevitable that it will. It does. It will. It has. Um, and just to, you know, I don't know, God's not keeping score. God doesn't keep score with those who are clothed in the righteousness of Christ. He doesn't. That score, that 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 game's over, um, and that's just uh, so. Yeah, I, I, it's not like now get out there and change the world. Don't just sleep in, and uh, you know, <laughs> feel the freedom not to read your Bible tomorrow. If if you're if it's burning, if you think doing it's going to make God love you more, then don't do it for that reason. Okay, uh, I can think of times when I was at my absolute worst and most desperate, suicidal. Even I didn't read my Bible. I didn't pray. The prayers I did pray were forgive me, but basically F you prayers to God. It's true. Um, I was so upset and angry and felt like he was being unfair and unjust and all this stuff. Um, and he never blinked, never bailed, never looked, looked at me differently. Um, and that reality of who he is, especially when we're at our worst, just, it softens us and it just makes us, I'm, I'm, I love God more now than I ever have in my life. And it's because I know that his love for me is not dependent on my love for him. And that's just a, it's a, it's a, it's a beautiful thing. I mean, it's just a beautiful thing. So just rest, rest, rest and believe. Um, when Jesus' disciples in John chapter 6, I think it's John chapter 6, came to him and said, Jesus, tell us what we need to be doing in order to be doing the works of God. It's a question I've gotten as a pastor many times. What do I need to be doing to be doing God's will or whatever, whatever form of question that is? And Jesus says, do you want to know what you should be doing in order to be you know, doing the will of the Father? Yes, tell us. He says, okay, I'll tell you. And they're all excited. You know, they get out their iPads. They're getting ready to take notes and they're getting ready to make their checklists so that they can do the right things for God. And in a very anticlimactic way, Jesus simply says, believe in the one who he sent. That's it. Like, that's it. That's what you got. Just, just believe in the one he sent. All the rest, I got. Just believe in the one who sent. And then to add to that, the only way we can believe in the one he sent is for God to give us the grace of belief. So it's all of grace from beginning to end. And knowing that just helps me go, I'm just, I'm not as hard on myself as I used to be. And I think that's actually made me a better neighbor, a better husband, a better dad, a better granddad, a better, a better friend. Um, you'd think, well, if you're not hard on yourself, you're not going to be a better person. I think, 
not being hard on myself has probably made me a better person, whatever that means anyway. But um, just because I'm, I'm, I trust more and more that God's grace is amazing. So just, yeah, it's a long answer to just simply say rest, but yeah. All right, one left. Dan is oh, the last oh. one. Well, first, Andy says you're way more jacked in person than he saw in pictures, and he wants to know if you'll play on our softball team next year. <laughs> I'm not good at softball. Use, we could use I'm a not, strong bat. At the no, I'm not, I'm not good at softball, but I can I can out push up anybody in this room. But I but I, I'm not good at softball. I'm just <laughs> Uh, so my question comes more from when reading the book and, and going through it, I feel as Christians, and I'll caveat this with I'm a white belt in Christianity, so I'm sure there's people that know a lot more than me, but how I came to Jesus, besides my wife, was like, I, I felt really unworthy to come to church, right? Because you feel like the law is what you get, like, right? I'm going to walk in, I'm either going to be struck by lightning or everybody's going to be like, tell me your sins because you're not good enough to be here. And I feel like in society, as Christians, like that's the message that we send out to society. And then we wonder why society is so against religion. It's because they feel like they're going to be judged. Uh, and I'm not here to solve all society's problems, but I think a lot of us in this room have brothers, sisters, friends, cousins, like people that could use that message. Because to me, where it really clicked was like, oh, wait, Jesus hung out with broken people. I'm completely broken, mm -hmm. and he loves them. Maybe he can give that unconditional love to me. Yeah. So I think about how do we deliver that message to a society and people and friends and neighbors that might think like, well, Dan's a Christian now. He's one of them Jesus freaks. He's going to judge me. He's going to yeah. be like, oh, you got to follow the law. You got to do this. Like, I think about that in my day-to-day -day because when I get those questions or I talk to a brother or friend, it's like, how do I help them understand what I know? That's a great question. We have a PR problem as a Christian community, in large part because this message has not been predominant. If this were the predominant message thundering from pulpit after pulpit after pulpit after pulpit all around the world, we wouldn't have that problem. We would be known as the greatest forgivers on planet Earth, the greatest mercy givers on planet Earth, the most gracious people on planet Earth. Um, I've never met, I've had a handful of people over the course of my life walk away from Christianity, reject Christianity, and none of them have rejected Christianity on the basis that Christianity is first and foremost about love and forgiveness and grace and mercy. Nobody's walking away from that because those are universal human longings. You don't have to be a Christian to long for forgiveness, to long for love, to long for mercy and grace when you screw up. You, you don't have to be a Christian to long for those things. You just have to be a human to long for those things. And I've never met anybody who's walked away from Christianity because they're walking away from those things. What they're walking away from is some caricature of the Christian faith that was delivered to them in some way, shape, or form that was in some way demanding that they become better than they are if they're going to ever get God to like them, you know? Um, so uh, I, I don't really know uh, what to do about that other than in my just staying in my lane and preaching and sort of delivering the message when and where I can in the hopes that it will catch and spread and, you know, things, good things will happen as a result. Um, but I was sitting at, Stacy and I were at dinner a couple, couple weeks ago with a, a couple from our church and one of the, the guy, the husband asked me, so how, when you're talking to a non-Christian, um, how, how, how quickly in your conversation do you like sort of get to Jesus? And I said, I don't. And he kind of looked at me like, what do you mean you don't? And I said, listen, I had a wise man once tell me that when the student is ready, the teacher appears. And that means that unsolicited advice, or if I'm talking to somebody about someone they're not inquiring about, they're not going to listen, no matter what I say. So I explained to this guy, I said, my sort of form of, uh, you know, evangelism, if you will, is to just be a good friend and wait because life's going to fall apart. Something's going to happen. Kid's going to go off the deep end. Cancer diagnosis is going to come in. Um, the wife's going to leave. The husband's addiction is going to be exposed. Something. Okay, something's going to happen in the course of life. 
that is going to make whoever I'm talking to feel desperate. And if I've been just a gracious, caring, look in your eye when you're talking to me kind of friend, they're going to come to me when that happens. And that will be the moment when I'm able to tell them about this God of unconditional love that promises to never leave them or forsake them regardless of what they do or what they've done. Um, but until that moment, and so I don't, I think changing the world is above our pay grade. I think the guy used to think at 30 years old, I was like, I'm going to change the world. And then I hit 50 and I realized, change the world. I can't change my wife, my kids, my friends, my, myself, much less the world. I suck at this changing other people's stuff. Um, so I, I just, I've kind of given up on that pipe dream. Um, and I just go, the best way for me to deliver the relief that this message delivers is by just allowing this message to affect me in such a way that it just slows me down, makes me care about people, and causes me to be a better friend. And then, like I said, just the best, the most effective form of evangelism is be a good friend and wait. <laughs> because when the wheels fall off, which they inevitably do, if you've been the good friend, they'll come to you. So, so when the when the student is ready, the teacher appears. Well, uh, I would love to keep going. You know what that means? We're just going to have to have you back. Very yes. Soon, right? Right? We'll do it. Well, we not, love it. We love not. it up here. We love you guys, and we love Reach Church. So thank you. Thank you, guys. You're incredibly attentive, and uh, thank you for honoring me by sitting here and listening to me ramble on and on about a subject that I love so very much. Um, and thanks for having your church go through the book. That's, I'm, I'm, that was awesome. So thank you. Well, I told them, um, you know, Gwen and I got a text from you uh, before Fallen and Free. It was a conference that Tullian's Church put on in February. Which I'm inviting all of you yes. to, to this February in Jupiter. Seriously, you guys need to make plans now. It, the weather sucks here in February, <laughs> and it's amazing in Jupiter. So come. It's amazing. It's, it's th two and a half days of this stuff right here. Yeah, they can make their own travel arrangements. Yeah, though. yeah, yeah, yeah. The church will pay for you guys if you... I'm just kidding. You got an insurance check for some fire I heard of. I'm sure that can cover all of you guys. <laughs> Bill said, go for it. That's what he said. <laughs> I love it. But it, it was one of those things, you know, um, you were like, hey, are you guys coming? And we, you know, we, did, we weren't sure. And so we did. And at the conference, I was just so reminded that Message after message, that's who I want to be as a pastor. And I need those constant reminders because we are, as one of your favorite hymns I know says, prone to wonder. And we are all, including me, including you, including all of us, prone to wonder right back to what I have to do right. to earn God's yes, that's favor. good. And it was such a reminder and a clarity for me mm -hmm. as the pastor of this church to do everything I can to remain steadfast to that yeah, message. That's awesome. Because it's so important. And hopefully what those who come to Reach Church heard tonight wasn't really anything new. Yeah. But no. we all need this reminder all the time. That's why we come to church every week, every week, right? To be reminded of this. So if you come back on Sunday, unfortunately, Tullian won't be here. But you're going to hear the same thing. Yes. And if you tune in to Tullian, like I do every week, by the mm. way. I'm um, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Can't you find a better use of your time? <laughs> it's, it's only while I'm mowing the grass. Yeah, okay, There's that's fine. no other better option. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. But if you turn, tune in to him, tune in to me, it, it's, you need this reminder. Every yeah, week. Martin Luther so important. said, I have to preach the gospel to myself every day because I forget it every day. And I have to preach the gospel to my people every week because they forget it every week. Now, we're way out of time, but I have to say this. I have to mention this because you mentioned prone to wander. And, and, and this, I, I've, I've talked about this recently, but growing up when I heard that hymn, prone to wander, what comes to mind when you think of 
prone to wander, like wandering into some sinful behavior, wandering back into addiction, wandering toward pornography, wandering toward this, wandering toward that, you know, wandering toward things you shouldn't be wandering toward. But you made the absolutely accurate point. What does prone to wander really mean? It's prone to wandering back to what I have to do. That's the forbidden territory. Okay, if there is a forbidden territory, that's the forbidden territory. Um, it's not, you know, uh, while all those other things are bad and will hurt your life and hurt those around you, so don't do them. I'm not saying do it, it doesn't matter. I mean, you, you will hurt yourself and you'll hurt other people if you give in to destructive behavior, okay? So don't do it for that reason alone. Um, but this whole idea, when we read the Bible and we're told to, you know, pursue holiness and pursue, and we automatically turn those into behavior modification verses. When it's like, the, the, I mean, what those things are warning us against is going back to what do I need to do? And resting in what's already been done, which is the hardest thing for us to do. Hardest thing for us. You tell me what to do. It may bother me, but it doesn't offend me. You tell me that I don't have to do anything. Now I'm offended because I want skin in the game. I want something I got to do. So I love the fact that you pointed that out, that prone to wander means wandering back to what do I need to do? Love that. You will hear the same message week in and week out from this guy, which is one of the reasons, one of the many reasons why I respect him as much as I do and admire him as much as I do. So if this is not your home church, if you're or from another church and you're just here visiting tonight, leave that church, okay? And come to this one, all right? That's my final word. <laughs> well, uh, thank you all for joining us tonight. Can we thank Talene and Stacy again for coming?